A while ago, I showed you one way to generate electric power using a lemon. When you do that, you get what's called direct current. Last time, I showed you another possibility. That involved using a simple coil of wire and a magnet. When you generate power this way, the, the current runs back and forth or up and down, and it's called alternating current. And this is the way nearly all power, electrical power, is generated. The best way of doing it is not to move the coil back and forth, but to make it spin around steadily like that in the magnetic field. And that is the way virtually all electric power is really generated. But of course, generating the power that way requires energy to spin the coil against the magnetic forces and drive the current around. That's usually done using a heat engine, a gas turbine, which is fired by a fossil fuel like oil or coal or gas or by a nuclear reactor, or even by water in a hydroelectric generator. I wanted to show you how to build one of these in case you're ever stranded on a desert island and have to reconstruct civilization from scratch. <laughs> so I had a simple one made up for you. This is a water wheel, which goes around like that when there's water running on it. And when it goes around, it turns a coil, much like that one over there, between the poles of this permanent magnet. The electrical output of the generator comes out on that oscilloscope, which is simply a device for showing the voltage. As long as the trace on the oscilloscope is going across horizontally, nothing is happening. But when we start generating electric power, it will start going up and down like this. Okay, so when you see that going up and down, you know that we're generating electricity. And all I have to do to generate electricity is to turn on the water. All right, are you ready for this? You better get out your umbrellas in the first few rows. Here we go. And there it is, hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power. No mortal created it, but a hundred years ago, one man could foresee its enormous potential. As a child, he'd read of Niagara Falls and dreamt of a wheel run by these cascading waters. Eventually, his dream took the shape of a vast electric power grid and spun like a dynamo to drive the modern industrial age. The man's name was Nikola Tesla, and his vision, a theory and practice that could finally harness the power of Niagara, was grounded in the principle of alternating current. Alternating current, AC, is an oscillating current. It is produced by a voltage that rises and falls, positive and negative like a sine wave. But as Nikola Tesla discovered, defining alternating current was just the beginning of his ups and downs. He wanted AC to power everything on Earth. But in the real world, the world of business, that idea met with enormous resistance. Right from the start, he came up against the electrical powers that were, Thomas Alva Edison, that is, and the advocates of direct current. Direct current, DC, is a steady flow of electricity. Ideally, its voltage is constant and equal to the current, which is also constant, multiplied by the effective resistance of the circuit. Obviously, on the basic issue of alternating versus direct current, Edison and Tesla were on different wavelengths. And in what was called the War of the Currents, battle lines were drawn. But the battle reached far beyond the comparatively safe domain of scientific theory. Many other interests were involved. Fortunes were made and lost. Powerful men and ideas advanced and retreated. Just what was behind all this sound and fury? Tesla arrived in New York in 1884, a 29-year-old immigrant from Eastern Europe. Tesla had a book of poetry fluency in a dozen languages, and less than a nickel in his pocket. But he also had a letter of introduction to Thomas Edison, who gave the young man a job redesigning dynamos at the Edison machine works. Of course, there was one condition. The dynamos had to be direct current. 
And of course, since Tesla was determined to make alternating current the world standard, his career with Thomas Edison had only one way to go. Within a year, Tesla had quit, partly because Edison allegedly wouldn't keep his promise of a bonus. Tesla soon fell on hard times and was, once again, virtually penniless. By sticking to his principle of alternating current, Tesla had not only hit bottom, he'd thrown a wrench into the most powerful machinery on the face of the earth. When it came to putting electricity to work, no man in the world could hold a candle to Thomas Alva Edison. He was seen as the mastermind of the electric age. As the electric general of what became the General Electric Company, Edison wasn't called Napoleon simply because the actress Sarah Bernhardt said he looked the part. Even today, his headquarters, the Edison Laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, remains alive in the public imagination. As a fitting tribute, it's been reassembled from the ground up, plank by plank, and preserved at the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. When Edison was alive, he was the creative force behind just about every bright idea under the sun. Though Edison's own hearing was impaired, his genius produced the world's first phonograph. And for the record, he also invented the motion picture camera. It was in Menlo Park, not Hollywood, that the movies really began to flicker. With this invention, Edison's ticker tape machine, the blood pressure of business could rise and fall with the pulse of the stock exchange. And whatever the news, it traveled far and fast with Edison's vastly improved version of the repeating telegraph. In fact, he often refined others' inventions making them more practical and commercially viable in the process. Others invented the first telephone and the first typewriter, but Edison developed both into handy, effective instruments. On the other hand, sometimes Edison sought to destroy, not improve, someone else's idea. The glow in Thomas Edison's heart, unlike the one he'd put here in Menlo Park, was faint indeed toward Nikola Tesla and his idea of alternating current. And no wonder. Beginning with the Sally Jordan boarding house, the first home in the world to be lit electrically, Edison's direct current was on its way to lighting every house within the limited reach of his network of power stations. And Edison knew that even in the simplest circuits, Tesla's alternating current could be full of surprises. For example, consider a simple circuit that consists of an alternating voltage source, a capacitor, and an inductor. According to the mathematical rules of Gustav Kirchhoff, the rise in voltage at the source, never bigger than E sub zero, is equal to the sum of the voltage drops around the circuit. The result is a differential equation that can be written in terms of the charge Q on the capacitor. The same differential equation also describes the displacement X of a harmonic oscillator driven by an oscillating force. Even a small force, never bigger than F sub zero, at just the right frequency, causes oscillations that grow bigger and bigger. And that adds up to the phenomenon of resonance, which means that in an AC circuit, even a tiny oscillating voltage can cause the flow of an amazing amount of electric charge. in a mechanical system, the results of resonance can be shattering. But sometimes it takes electric resonance to get the tune just right. Tesla was, in fact, 
the first to describe a network of tuned resonant circuits and raised antennas, which is exactly how radio and television signals are transmitted and received. A single television station is picked out of all others because an AC circuit is tuned precisely in resonance with the broadcasting frequency. That's true of radio as well as television. An electrical resonance occurs because mathematically, capacitors and inductors act a lot like springs and masses. For example, when a capacitor starts to charge, it creates a voltage that opposes the charge. In other words, a capacitor opposes change in positive or negative charge, just as a spring opposes expansion or compression. On the other hand, when a voltage is applied to an inductor, it takes a while to get the current moving, or takes a while to stop it again. So an inductor opposes change in current in the same way the inertial mass on a spring opposes change in velocity. But no matter how precise the analogy, differences can arise. For example, when resonance occurs in electrical oscillators, it seldom lets people down. But when resonance occurs in mechanical oscillators, things can get out of hand. In electric circuits, resistance can help keep things from getting out of hand. For example, consider a capacitor and a resistor in an AC circuit. If the frequency is low enough, the charging and discharging of the capacitor can keep up with the oscillating applied voltage. But at higher frequency, the capacitor can't charge and discharge fast enough, so no voltage difference develops across it, and nearly all the voltage is across the resistor. On the other hand, if an inductor's in the circuit, at low frequency, there's plenty of time to build up current in it without much voltage across it. But at higher frequency, the current in the inductor can't change fast enough before it has to turn around. So the voltage is mostly across the inductor and there's not much left across the resistor. When all the elements are in the same circuit at low frequency, most of the voltage goes into charging and discharging the capacitor. At higher frequency, more of the voltage is used up trying to change the current in the inductor. In fact, at very high frequency, the inductor virtually keeps any current from flowing at all. But if the frequency is just right, in other words, at the resonant frequency, a quite large current flows. The capacitor charges and discharges. Current builds up and reverses in the inductor. And the resistor burns up enough energy to keep the oscillations under control. Of course, Edison and company still had the business of electricity under control. And to retain that control, they put up plenty of resistance against the increasing powers of alternating current. So, if Tesla was to win the war of the currents, he'd need a champion to rise up and do business against the forces of Thomas Edison. And that's where George Westinghouse came into the picture. Westinghouse, the legendary industrialist of Pittsburgh, was an inventor turned big businessman. But in contrast to Edison, he not only spoke glowingly of alternating current, he put his money where his mouth was and bought Tesla's patents for a polyphase induction motor. And in 1888, the war of the currents escalated. As Westinghouse went to work in support of Tesla, 
Edison's well-oiled machinery shifted into high gear. There were smear campaigns and, according to some people, dirty tricks. Occasionally, however, there was a meeting of the minds. Charles Steinmetz, the mathematical wizard of physics and engineering, offered a certain intellectual support to both camps. Edison and Tesla were even able to work together, but not for long, and never as long as Tesla had the advantage of alternating current. In theory and practice alike, why was Tesla's method better? Obviously, the reason a plant generates electricity is to send power somewhere to transmit it through power cables into the home, the office, or anywhere else there's a need and a handy socket. But the power is equal to the current times the voltage. Therefore, the same power can be transmitted at high current and low voltage, or low current and high voltage. Which is better? Remember, the power cables have a certain amount of resistance. And the longer the distance, the bigger the resistance, because a cable's resistance is proportional to its length. And of course, passing current through a resistance causes heating, which is equal to current squared times resistance. This is wasted heat. For the power company and the consumer, that means a certain amount of energy won't be available at the other end. Since I is P over V, that heating is P squared R over V squared. So for any given power and resistance, the higher the voltage, the less power lost in transit. In other words, the key to transmitting power efficiently is to transmit it at the highest possible voltage. In a modern electric power grid, energy is routinely transmitted over thousands of kilometers at hundreds of thousands of volts. But no matter how it's used, the recipient wants all those watts to arrive at a safe and handy voltage. And that's possible only if the electric energy can be transformed up to high voltage, which it takes to make the long trip to the consumer, and back down to low voltage for use at the end of the line. That task, raising and lowering voltage, is hard to accomplish with direct current, but with AC, it's comparatively easy. If alternating current passes through a loop or coil, it produces a constantly changing magnetic flux. A bar of iron, magnetized by the coil, can concentrate and intensify the changing flux. In fact, an iron ring can contain the flux entirely. And if a secondary circuit is wound around the ring, as the changing flux passes through it, a voltage is induced in it. That voltage is proportional to the number of turns around the iron. Obviously then, the voltage of the power transmitted to the secondary circuit can be made higher or lower than the voltage in the primary circuit. So although the power out is nearly equal to the power in, it can be stepped up to high voltage for long range transmission and then brought down to low voltage for safe use at the end of the line. It's exactly this principle which is the greatest advantage of Tesla's AC over Edison's DC. And while it was revolutionary at the end of the 19th century, that principle would be applied from one end of the earth to the other in the 20th. That fact, the overwhelming evidence that alternating current powers the modern industrial world, makes the case for declaring Tesla the winner in the war of the currents.
On the other hand, with wars and stories alike, there are always two sides. Considering Edison's enormous contribution to the world of science and engineering, did one side really win and the other really lose? After all, Edison did have a convincing number of patents. Before Tesla, Edison built his own generators, one after another, each more powerful than the last. But then, so had Tesla. And surely as well as Edison, he too built turbines and motors. However, and this was the big difference in the long run, Edison's generators could only illuminate things within the reach of his power plant, while Tesla's AC system could reach beyond the old neighborhood. With an ever-expanding grid of power lines, AC could go from coast to coast and just about everywhere in between. Nonetheless, Thomas Edison's place in history was secure. And in Menlo Park, New Jersey, his mind was still as lively as his motion picture camera. As an American inventor and electrician, no one since Ben Franklin had gone as far as Thomas Edison. But in his own way, Nikola Tesla would go even farther. Long before they became a reality, Tesla had envisioned vacuum tubes coated with phosphor and glass tubes filled with gas, fluorescent lights and neon lights. And years before the Wright brothers appeared, Tesla claimed that if aviation were to get off the ground, it would need to use a then almost unknown metal called aluminum. And while Guglielmo Marconi got the acclaim of the popular press for inventing the radio, Nikola Tesla got the credit, as well as the final verdict in the courts. Speaking of credit, some state that Tesla was denied his due for many original inventions. In all, no one can deny that Tesla was one of the most dynamic scientists who ever lived nor that his mind was fertile and inventive beyond compare. But Tesla, more interested in invention than in scientific publications, kept much of his methodology in his head. Perhaps that's why the scientific community remained dubious or miserly with its praise for years. He did, however, receive honorary doctorates from Columbia and Yale. And in the end, with unintended irony, Nikola Tesla was even honored with the Edison Medal, that most prestigious award named for none other than Thomas Edison himself. Throughout this long yarn we've been spinning, there have always been certain individuals whom we could identify as the saints of science. These were people who were driven to scientific discovery the way moths are attracted to light. They would include Kepler and Newton, Faraday, and certainly Albert Einstein. Some of these people did very well for themselves. In fact, a few became quite wealthy. But obviously, it was not money that drove them to do what they did. But at the same time, there's always been a different kind of genius. These were people just as clever as the others, but people who had their eyes firmly fixed on the bottom line. One, of course, was Thomas Edison. But there was also James Watt and Henry Ford, and there were many others. Such people typically spent as much time in law courts litigating patents as they spent making their inventions. One is tempted to draw a distinction between the saintly scientists and the money-grubbing technologists. But of course, there was an exception that proved the rule. Incidentally, I've never liked that phrase very much, the exception that proves the rule. I think it must come from an archaic meaning of the word to prove, which used to mean to test. An exception tests a rule. If it's truly an exception, then the rule can't be right. Well, there was an exception who tested the rule and found it wanting, and that was Nikola Tesla. 
Tesla was certainly a genius of the first magnitude. If Michael Faraday could imagine space filled with lines of constant force, Nikola Tesla could picture multiphase generators and multiphase motors all connected with complex electrical circuits, and when they were built, all of it would work perfectly exactly as he had imagined it. Time and again, Tesla made fortunes and squandered them, or turned down soft jobs with fat salaries just so he could be left alone to think and to invent. You might say that Tesla, like da Vinci before him, was a true saint of engineering. He died almost forgotten and almost penniless in New York City. But it was Nikola Tesla at least as much as Thomas Edison who shaped the nature of the world that we live in today. OK, I'll see you next time. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org. <laughs>